Hi. Hi. I would like to pray as well. Okay. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would give me the words that would edify the church, that would give glory to you, and just put your words in my mouth and just um, show everyone what you've done in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, my name is Deborah Foley. I'm married to Gordon Scholl. And the reason I'm Foley is because my dad had sisters that married and, of course, changed their names to their husbands' names. And he had two brothers that never married, and my dad had four kids. They were all girls. So I stuck with the name Foley. And then my daughter, my granddaughter, named her her daughter, which is my great-granddaughter, with her last name Foley. So it's it will continue. But she'll be adopted, and it'll be hyphenated. So. That's why we have two different names. People like that. Um, I'm going to give you the basics. If I were to tell you everything that God's done in my life, we would be here a month of Sundays. So it's just the basic, and then maybe down the road, if I'm asked again, I'll add more. But um, when I was under the age of 10, I was tormented as to where I was going to go when I died. I was raised Catholic, and in, in the Catholic religion, you are you get to heaven by your good works. I would go to bed, and I would think, well, I think I was a good girl today. If I were to die, I would go to heaven. And then the next day, I would be a terror, and I would go to bed, and I'd think, well, I go to bed. If I die tonight, I'm going to hell. And this is the childhood that I had growing up. But then, uh, and if you watch, you can jot these scriptures down. I have scriptures to base everything on what I'm saying. Um, it's by grace that you're saved. It is not of good. It's by grace you are saved through faith, not of your works, lest any man shall boast. It is a gift from God. And that grace is, covers what we don't deserve. We deserve death. And he gives us his grace that we don't get what we deserve. Okay. I was raised where I had to learn the Ten Commandments. And in the Catholic religion, they rated them according to priority. Some were worse than others. But, uh, the, the Ten Commandments are in Exodus 23 through 17. But in the Bible, there is a, it, the first four talk about your relationship with God. The last six talk about your relationship with, with people. But what it boils down to is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and to love others as you love yourself. And if you do love others as you love yourself, you would not want to hurt them or steal from them or do any of what... The Ten Commandments, it shows us by the law that, that's, that we are sinners. Sin is sin to God. No sin is greater than another. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have. Romans 3.23. And we're to worship in the Ten Commandments. We're to worship only God. Don't make idols. Don't use God's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day holy. And the next six dealing with people are honor your mother and your father. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness against your neighbor, and don't covet. And growing up, I didn't hear much of the first four. I didn't hear much about don't take the Lord's name in vain. I heard don't steal. It was more of the relationship with people, more so than the relationship with God. I was uh, scared to death of God. I was raised picturing him with a sledgehammer that if I did something wrong, I was going to be punished. Because as a child growing up, if I did something wrong, I got punished. So that's the way God is. And he was a hard ruler and was ready to punish me. One of the things I can say about the Catholic religion, it does teach you reverence for God. You, you do learn to reverence him. Uh, 
my fear of the Lord now is different than the fear of the Lord back then. I was scared to death of him, and now I fear him to not want to sin against him. That's the healthy fear. Um, one night, I was, okay, so I may have over there now. Okay, I have ADD. So growing up, I was treated with a behavior issue rather than a, um, a physical issue. It was considered instead of an illness. So I was always sent to bed early, constantly. I had to go to bed early. I don't think I ever saw the go to bed when the sun was actually down. <laughs> and so I would look out my bedroom window. And back then, Disney was big. And when you wish upon a falling star, all your dreams will come true. Well, I'd also heard that when you see a falling star, you do all your wishes before the star actually disappears and you'll get your wish. But if it disappears before, you don't get your wish. And I remember, and it, it, I remember wishing this, but I also now know that it was an actual prayer. Because when I was looking out the window, I saw a falling star, and I wished that I could go to heaven. That was my wish as a kid. I was tormented with it. And it, I got my wish before the star went out. But I didn't know how I was going to get there. I, I'm going to try to be good. I did get all the words out before it burned out. So moving on to seventh grade, I went to a, a Gaither service, <coughs> Gaither family, and um, one of my friends asked me to go to this concert, so I went with her. And I went forward to accept Christ, and my I was very strict. I had to be home at a certain time, and they you go back and you talk to someone, and they give you all this material and stuff. Well, I I didn't have time. I got to go. My mom's gonna kill me if I get home late, and so I couldn't really talk to them. But I came home and I explained to them, my mom, that I received Jesus, and she told me if I'd have known you were gonna come home. And talking about that stuff, I would have never let you go. And so back into the Catholicism I went. Again, I was under my parents' rule, seventh grade. And so I remained Catholic, and that's as far as my, my uh, salvation went at the time. But my mom did get saved eight years later because of my, one of my favorite verses that I held dear to my heart, Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, and thy household. And I saw my household come to the Lord one by one. But um, I, I'm going to I'm going to lead into I was adopted by my maternal grandparents. And one day I was thinking uh, I was driving down the road. I don't suggest doing this, but I did this anyway. I was driving down the highway, and I had my Bible next to me, and I. I flipped it open to the New Testament because I, I wanted to study a scripture in my head while I was driving. So I flipped it open to where I thought the New Testament was because I don't want to go began who, began who, and I'm not, no, you know, yeah. not being able to think about all that. So I flipped it open. I looked down. It's Acts 16, 31. My favorite verse. It's like, okay, I said I would, I would think about this particular verse. I'm going to meditate on it. So Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I do. Thou shalt be saved, I am, and thy household. Then my mind started going nuts. Yeah, I'm adopted. So does that mean my biological parents are my household? Or is it my parents that I was raised in? And now I'm married. What, you know, what, what household? And what went into my heart was as far as your faith. And you... We are family. Out there can be our family. It can be our household. It's our faith that can lead our, our lives, leading others to him. And oh, that's awesome. Okay. Um, I got pregnant at 17, and um, I married my 17-year-old husband, and I had four beautiful children by the time I was 25. But as soon as I got married, which I think is one of the biggest blessings about of being married at a young age, is that God got me in the seeking mode again. 
I was out from under my parents, Catholic role, and my mom wasn't saved yet at that time. But God started having me seek him again. And seek and you shall find, and that's in, um, I think, Matthew 7, 7. Um, what, as soon as I got married, okay, um, I, did, I gave birth to my second child when I was 19. And I remembered hearing about Herod having all the children under the age of two be killed and, because he was trying to kill Jesus. So here I am holding my baby son and thinking, how could a loving God allow any child under the age of two to be killed? I'm holding my son. What would I feel like back then? That's where the seeking started because I still had this God with a sledgehammer over my head. And one of the things too that I heard this not on my notes is that things happen to us because of punishment. Um, you've lost a child because of the sin in your life. Well, if that's the case, I wouldn't have had any children, and none of us would. <coughs> you know, God is not with a sledgehammer up there. He's a very loving God. He's a just God. He, you know, we're not going to get away. We're not going to be able to get away with things because He loves us. Loves He'll bring us back. But He's not up there ready to throw the gavel. And I can't emphasize that enough. But anyway, all that is in Matthew 2, 16 through 18 about Herod. But about Herod, it's the same idea as how come bad things happen to good people. It's the same thing as why do good things happen to bad people. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. The hardiest plants grow in the most adverse environments. But my question was spewing everybody. I was asking everybody about this because it was driving me crazy. And out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks, Luke 6, 45. And I, my heart was saying, how can a just God do this? How can he allow this? Well, I asked the question to the right person, so I thought. Because I was, in the Catholic religion, if you were to have a Bible study, it was, you are going to read this section and you stick with, with this. If you have questions, this is what you ask about. You don't go any further. So, this person that I asked answered my questions from the Bible. It's like, hmm which is a Catholic, we weren't supposed to read it, except for what I just mentioned. This person was a Jehovah's Witness. And I thought, how can they call the Jehovah's Witnesses a cult when they're preaching from the Bible? Little did I know they changed their wording, but I didn't know that at the time. Meanwhile, as I was studying with Jehovah's Witnesses for nine months before he came baptized, I committed a mortal sin as a Catholic, as the Catholics labeled it. So now I was so disappointed in myself, and I'm going to hell. I can go rob a bank, I can kill anybody. It was, my, it, my testimony is set to go to hell. There's no way out. I've committed the worst sin possible in my mind. And I committed several, several of the smaller sins in the Ten Commandments, but it was that one mortal sin. Because when you do the, the smaller sins in the Ten Commandments, the priest goes and tells you to say a few prayers, and you're good to go. And another thing is I don't need to go tell a human sinful priest my sins because God is my mediator between myself and God. Jesus is the mediator. And that's in 1 Timothy 2.5. Anyway, I was riddled with guilt. I was very disappointed in myself. It's one of the biggest things that I've had problems with all my life is I do not want to be a disappointment to anyone. I, I was good because I didn't want to be a disappointment. When my moms would tell me that I'm going to tell your dad what you did when he gets home, it wasn't because I was afraid of his, his being upset with me or, or spanking me. It was, I, I want my dad to think I'm perfect. I do not want to be a disappointment. 
and here I, I disappointed God and myself, which are the worst two that you can disappoint. I've always lived in a controlling environment, and with that I've always felt like I've been a disappointment because I can't meet their expectations. And because I can't meet their expectations, yep, even felt like God was controlling, and, and in con he was in control, but not controlling, and I've learned that. Well, my cousins came to visit, and they started talking to me about the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I defended them, and I said, well, what do you have against the Jehovah's Witnesses anyway? I don't, we don't have anything against the people, it's their doctrine. Oh, well, what do you mean? And anyway, they were new Christians, and they got out this book, The Way to God, and sat down with them page by page, and it showed me over here in a big gulf here, and God here, and there is no way I can get across. Of course, I'm going to hell, so I know there's no way now, especially. And the next page, there was a cross <coughs> in the middle of the two. Here's me, a cross, and God. And I can walk across that cross through his blood to get to the other side and be with God. Mm -hmm. And I gave my life to the Lord that day. It was May 7th, 1979. Mm -hmm. All my guilt of all my past, of all my disappointments, of all my sin, my mortal sins, my big sins, my little sins, I was free. Amen. I was forgiven. I was saved. I had victory. Whoa, I didn't know it was going to be so hard. <laughs> anyway, what had happened with back to the Jehovah's Witnesses, because now I'm still part of that. Um, they were new Christians and they didn't really know how to explain to me the differences in the doctrine versus Christianity. So she, they had the pastor of a um, God-fearing, rightly dividing the word of God pastor came to my house. And my two cousins were here. The two Jehovah Witnesses were here. The pastor was at the end of the table, and I was at this table. I felt like I was the judge and jury of my <laughs> own eternal life. And for three hours, it was back and forth, back and forth, with everyone talking and everybody saying the same thing, it sounded like to me. I wasn't getting any, it's like, wow, they all, everybody sounds good here. I don't know what to believe. <coughs> and the pastor said, well, I guess we're not going to be able to come to any type of conclusion. Let's have a, a word of prayer and end this session. I thought their pants were on fire. They stood up and they said, no, we will not pray with you. We don't pray to the, the same way, same God, or whatever. And it's like, that was the clincher. That was the clincher. I mean, it wasted three hours, but it was, it was good learning. But it was, that was the clincher. They wouldn't pray with me. And that was it. I was, didn't have any like, part of them anymore. And I did find a lot of their <laughs> scriptures false. They had added some scriptures in their Bible and taken away, and in the last book of Revelation it talks about what happens to people that do that. And what's sad is the cults are following a religion, which religion means a man-made thought. It's not out of the Bible, God-inspired word. Okay. So then now I'm not a Jehovah's Witness anymore, I'm trying to figure out what church to go to. I started going to this pastor's church that led me, you know, to the Lord. He was one that baptized me. I couldn't wait to get baptized, so I was pregnant with my third child. And in June, a month later, in Montana, at Homestake Lake, freezing cold, <laughs> I got baptized. It was awesome. Well. My, my ex-husband had came home, come home from work, and he said, because I wanted him to be saved too, but he says, there is a, a Bible study that's going on at these people's house. Do you want to go? And, man, sure. 
Naps, let's go. And so we went to these, this, these, this house, and it was called the Way International, which is another cult. <laughs> and when I went in there, they, they based their religion on John 10.10. 10. Um, I come to give you life and life abundantly, which means let's go party, let's have drinks, let's live it up. Because God came to give us life and life abundantly. That is not the life God wants us to have. It's the life in him, and when you're a Christian, there's more fun being a Christian than there is being in the world by far. And anyway, another thing too they told me is that I could pay $3,000 if I wanted to learn, learn to speak in tongues with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't pay. It's a gift. I'm not I don't know. <laughs> that was next. <bad. laughs> Okay, so what did I say out here? John 10.10 10 is a scripture. Christ following a Christian had passed from death to life in Christ is that life abundantly. Well, the way he took it as long, it took it as let's have a drinking party, okay? I end up $3,000. We already talked about that. So I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding. The next day, I got on my knees. I said, Lord, I have been involved with so many different denominations and thoughts and religions, and will you please just show me the truth? I want your truth. And I had gotten a living Bible as a new Christian. Um, it was easy for me to read, I was 21. And I couldn't put it down. If I was cooking dinner, here's a recipe and here's the Bible, you know. I couldn't put the Bible down. It was amazing what I was finding of the different religions that I was learn, learned from, of the things God showed me that were not correct in what they were teaching. Oh, it was awesome. Said none of it. Uh, which religion is truly the right one? I asked God, and he said, it's none of them. It's asking Jesus, Jesus to live in my heart and having a relationship with him. Oh, when I told you that I was adopted, one of the things that God showed me when I, after I received him as a savior, in Romans 8, 15, I am adopted he adopted me and when you have your own kid you get what you get and you don't throw a fit <laughs> when you get adopted you're chosen and my parents didn't have to take me in I could have lived the life that I was was doomed for or end up in a in a foster home or it ended up in an uh, orphanage. thank you orphanage and but God kept me from all of that. And I was raised with a beautiful family and taken as their own, took their name. That's another reason why I want to keep my name. And when I read that, Romans 8, 15, that he adopted me too, so I'm chosen twice. And I'm not a disappointment. I'm a child of God, forgiven. Because he didn't come to condemn me, but to save me, John 3, 17. I am a sinner saved by grace, which Jesus gave me when he died on the cross and came back to life. The Ten Commandments showed me the errors of my ways, and none of us can follow them on our own power. In Luke 10, 27, they are summed up in stating, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. There is more to my story. This is my foundation. But one more thing, when Jesus told us to forgive our enemies in Romans 12, 17 through 21, that also meant me forgiving me. Mm -hmm. Who am I to, when he tells me to forgive others that I'm not at the top of that list? We have to forgive ourselves before we can forgive others, to love ourselves before we can love others. We need to get on our knees and get right with God 
and turned all of our little sins, all of our big sins, all of our idiosyncrasies over to him. I was an enemy of God. I was an enemy of myself. Now he calls me friend. And I'm a friend to myself as well. That's John 15, 15. And loving one another means for me to love myself too. Thank you. Awesome.